greetings, everyone. It's wonderful to be together in this February, where in some areas of the world it's warm and very spring-like, and in other areas it's quite wintry still. So wherever you are, we're, we're very happy that we have the chance to be together in cyberspace. So um, we're very excited about our call today with Jane as our featured speaker. And we're going to begin as we always do with an invocation from Apila. Good morning. I'm lighting the fire from our cedar and our candle at Chartres. And in the indigenous way of North America, I offer this essence to our creator, to Mother Earth, and to the compelling directions of our lives as we receive inspiration from the North Star coming down through the hill of birth, Chartres, being reborn with the veil about us coming through vibrations and synchronicities, materialization, and radiant light. This moment giving birth to shape, to form, to movement. It's our life. And for those of us on this call, those who have been at Chartra with us, in the past 12 or 13 years, those of us coming, each of us in that well, that deep wellspring of memory, answering the longing, the call, the heart's desire for oneness, which we feel now around this virtual fire in this community of beloved voices and people and presences. We welcome you, and especially today, we welcome those ancestors, those impulses, those knowings that come through our friend, Jane. May this call ignite the sacred fire of renewal. Ah, Mama, Ua, Noa. Thank you, Apila, for your beautiful invocation. And as we are moving toward form, coming into form with Geometrica, um, I'd just like to give an overview of our call today. After um, I finish our introduction, Jim is gonna say a few words, give us um, some of his reflections and updates on how things are going with the university. And then Jane is our featured speaker, and we are very much looking forward to his talk on cosmogenesis. And I hope all of you who are here with us read his uh, write-up on what he's gonna be talking about today. It sounds pretty amazing. And there'll be a chance for discussion and questions toward the end um, as before we close our call. So, um, there's something that I, I thought I would share with you before um, Jim speaks, and that is that um, I encountered someone who has a tremendous background in Chart Cathedral and the mystical aspect of both um, numbers and the Hebrew alphabet. And one of the things that he shared with me is to do with the, the fires that have taken place at Chartres, which I found very interesting. And, um, you know, Jim always speaks about the fires, but there's sort of another dimension that he's added to this. Um, and so the actual first fire was in, in 1012, and that burnt down the entire church. Um, it, and then it was rebuilt under Fulbert. And in 1134, there was a second fire. And at that point, only the west facade burnt. 
But then in 1194, there was a third fire and the entire cathedral burnt down except for the west facade. And, and then most people don't make mention of this, but in 1836, there was a fourth fire where um, the roof burned and that's when the metal roof was replaced, the copper, copper roof. And so what um, lives in terms of the numbers of these fires, the dates, and how important fire is in spiritual development. We're living with, you know, the element of purification and the element of, of transformation. Fire is the alchemist's um, element of transformation. And if you take the date of the last fire, which is 1194, and you subtract from it the date of, excuse me, 1836 was the last fire, and you subtract from it the date of the first fire, which was 1020, you have the number 816. And if you look at this number, it's the transposition of 618 or 0.618, which Jane spoke to us about continuously last year as the golden ratio. And, and so if, if we think about fire and its power of transformation, we can think, for example, um, I don't know how many of you have read Dante's Divine Comedy, but in the, um, in, in the 27th canto of Purgatory, it's right at the end of Purgatory when, when Dante and Virgil are about to step out of Purgatory, but before they get to Paradise, they have to go through what's called Earthly Paradise. But before they can get into Earthly Paradise, they have to walk through a wall of fire. It's a huge wall, you know, like 20 feet high of very intense fire. And you, you can't exit purgatory to get into earthly paradise until you pass through this fire of purification. And so if we think about, and you know, Dante was writing um, in the Middle Ages, and this theme of fire is um, consistent, and these, you know, let's just look at sharp burning so many times. We have this aspect of, of purification, and the, the need for each one of us to pass through um, a purification to build our own inner temple is the picture that's being offered here. The cathedral was built over and over again. But it's, it's our task in our spiritual development to build an inner temple after passing through the fire of purification to reconstruct ourselves in a sense. And um, this is something that really caught my interest when I started to reflect on it and how it relates to the golden mean and how the inner temple that we... Um, seek to construct on our spiritual journey must be built in conjunction with this golden mean, the principle of sacred geometry. So I thought that was something interesting that I wanted to share today. Um, and very much look forward to seeing everybody in Sharp this summer so we can speak more about these things. And Jim, I'd like to invite you to share some of your reflections about things thank that you can hear And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Pila, for your invocation. And thank you, everyone. I see we have a, a very good number of people on the call, and I just want to acknowledge it. Uh, some of you are some of our undergraduates, and uh, as well as our, our graduates. And so I just want to uh, welcome everybody on the call. Some of you are probably uh, getting on for your first time. And uh, so 
uh, in the first instance, I really want to thank our creative director, Banafshe Sayad, and, and Bob uh, Meyer and uh, Claire Garrison for the work that they did uh, to uh, make uh, awareness of our course coming up in Chartres so widely uh, known. You probably have all been receiving e-blasts that have come through uh, your email. Uh, that's a, a, a new um, effort on our part uh, to uh, widen the circle of people aware of, of what we're doing in, in Chartres uh, in the hopes that uh, many of you will attend uh, the first week of July and uh, beyond Chartres to uh, uh, consider coming to our pilgrimage in uh, Paris uh, with Andrew Harvey and Georgie Zabo on mystical Paris. Uh, so I just want to welcome you. Uh, we've been present in Chartres since 2006 when we uh, commemorated the thousandth anniversary of uh, the founding of the Chartres Academy. Uh, Karen was just mentioning the fire in, in 1025. Uh, it was Fulbert from an Italian priest that founded the Chartres Academy uh, in 1006. And uh, he was the first bishop. And it was during his uh, uh, tenure that the cathedral uh, burnt, as Karen mentioned, and uh, he rebuilt it. And then uh, about a century and a half later, it burnt down again. And the uh, cathedral that we see today uh, has stood for just about 800 years. So a very long time for a building to stand. And uh, it was almost destroyed by the Nazis. And it's called the Queen of the Cathedrals because it's, it's consecrated uh, as a architectural expression of the cosmic mother and the divine feminine and its depth and its potency is derived that long before the Christians ever arrived on the scene, uh, the Druids and the Celts uh, for easily 1,500 years before the first Christians showed up, uh, consecrated Chartres uh, as, a, as the most sacred site in all of Europe, uh, dedicated and consecrated to the divine feminine. Uh, Chartres is our sacred heart of Ubiquity University, our sanctum sanctorum. Uh, it's the place that we uh, make pilgrimage every year uh, to renew our connection to the seven liberal arts that were fashioned first by Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle uh, 2,500 years ago, and then uh, carried to their most, I would say, artistic refinement by the uh, Chartrian masters in Chartres. And then about, they lasted about 200 years, disappeared. And it was uh, uh, the Wisdom School of Ubiquity University that uh, uh, on the thousandth anniversary brought that form back into modern expression. And so every year we take one of the seven liberal arts. And this year, uh, we're uh, exploring Geometrica, and uh, that uh, Plato, for example, uh, felt was the most important of the liberal arts. Uh, in his academy, uh, founded in the fourth century BC in ancient Athens in a grove of trees outside the city, uh, there was a, a sign saying, uh, unless you've studied geometry, don't enter here. So for Plato, the, 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 the primacy of number. Uh, and as we know uh, from Pythagoras and modern cosmology, uh, if you break the uh, universe of matter down, 
what you finally come to are numbers and frequency and geometric patterns. And so this year we're uh, extraordinarily privileged uh, to have uh, two masters of geometry, masters of number, uh, Jane 108 and, and Michael Rice um, uh, teaching uh, with us for our seven day uh, uh, ritual and initiatory process that each year we, we uh, conduct it at, at, at uh, uh, Chartres uh, in the seminary right next to the cathedral. In masters a thousand years ago uh, held their courses and their classes. Uh, and so um, the many dimensions of ubiquity uh, are all there for all of you students to participate in. Uh, but um, uh, Chartres and the pilgrimage to Chartres uh, is at the center of everything that we do. Uh, so I just want to welcome you uh, to the call and uh, welcome you to Chartres um, and welcome you to the mysteries. Ultimately, learning, as we know from Socrates, is not about pursuing answers. It's about uh, illuminating your life through questions. So at Ubiquity in our wisdom school, we, we, we take the time to, to ask the most profound questions that we can uh, fashion, knowing that answers are always elusive, but the net result is the transformation of the soul. I also want to just note before uh, turning it uh, over to Jane uh, for his uh, discourse today, that uh, we're in for a new bishop. <laughs> Uh, uh, we uh, have come to understand that the old, very conservative bishop uh, is no longer there. And uh, those of you who've been in Chartres over the last number of years know uh, how we've labored under the strictures of, of very conservative um, uh, ecclesiastical uh, authorities. Uh, and that were appointed by the previous Pope, Pope Benedict the, uh, the 16th, uh, who was the head of the Office of the Inquisition under Pope John Paul II. Uh, and um, uh, he appointed the, um, the, the, the bishop that, that is now uh, moved on. And so now we have the opportunity for Pope Francis uh, to appoint a new bishop. And that's very exciting to us. Uh, we hope that uh, the new bishop will uh, carry the spirit of the ancient Chartrian masters uh, in his heart and in his mind. Uh, and that the, the spirit of, of the original Chartrian aesthetic that understood that divinity was not something that you had to become a Christian or you had to study the Bible to attain. For the Chartrian masters, uh, studying a flower, looking at a rainbow, understanding the profound truth of number, would discover in the scriptures. And so that it's in that spirit that, that we have come to Chartres uh, each year, uh, inspired not only by the cathedral, but inspired by the Celtic roots, the Druidic roots out of which the cathedral was built and emerged. There would be no Chartres without the Celtic Druidic substrate. And, uh, and that's the place of Apila, who gave us our invocation. It's Apila, who is the link to the pre-Christian Celtic Druidic uh, fountainhead, out of which uh, the mysteries have endured now for uh, literally um, thousands of years. 
So as you think about coming to Chartres, please know that, that, that you're, you're in an auric space of extraordinary depth and that uh, literally millions of people over thousands of years have made pilgrimage to that sacred space to be graced uh, by the Black Madonna. And uh, we're getting set, well, this will be our 13th year uh, in Chartres. And each year we go, we go deeper, just a little layer deeper into the heart of the mystery. So for me, uh, 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 I can't uh, imagine not being in Chartres uh, the first week of every July. Uh, it's become one of the um, axial points of my life uh, each year. And so I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity to have been able to commemorate with Apila and with uh, a number of others as we did um, uh, 13 years ago uh, to found a Chartres, the new Chartres Academy uh, after Fulbert's Chartres Academy, which he founded in the spirit of Plato's Academy uh, in ancient Athens. So it's very exciting and I, uh, I, I can tell you uh, uh, having been to for 13, going on 13 years, that, that uh, Jane, uh, who was with us last year for Arithmetica, uh, was the, the most extraordinary uh, uh, spot of the true genius of mathematics. And I, I just want to acknowledge you, Jane, and I'm, I'm so delighted that you're coming back uh, to, uh, to grace us this next year, uh, because uh, all of us that experienced your teachings last year for arithmetic, <laughs> which for most people is the uh, definition of tedium, uh, the excitement that rippled through the room each day as Jane uh, uh, spoke about transformational mathematics, uh, to be carrying that in um, uh, now to Geometrica uh, is, uh, is quite extraordinary. And one of the things uh, also we're excited by is Anaf Shayad, who does the morning practice, uh, who's a dancer almost without peer, uh, into the mathematics of the body. Just think about that just for Jane. Everything we are, everything we think, everything we feel, everything we do with our bodies, everything we build with our hands. From Chartres Cathedral to an iPhone, ultimately is the engineering of the human mind, applying mathematics to the material world. So when we're talking about arithmetica, and now we're talking about geometrica, we're talking about how we fashion that which constitutes the universe itself into the form corresponding to our imagination. And um, that's why Plato said, on the signpost over the academy 2,500 years ago, uh, let he who has not studied geometry enter this place. So Jane, uh, welcome to our call. And uh, thank you for what you're now going to uh, uh, grace us with. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm currently in the Byron Bay area, which is in Australia. And I've just come back from a tour, working a lot with some children, um, mainly some autistic children and children who aren't being at normal schools. That's called homeschooling or natural schooling. These are the kids that don't work on desks and textbooks. So I've been doing a lot of um, 
workbooks for children and they don't have, because they don't understand mathematics, the best way to get to educating children is through geometry because geometry is highly visual content, which means anyone in the world can understand a symbol or a shape. So last year, as Jim said, we just talked a lot about, um, we talked a lot about numbers and patterns, but this time, this year, we're gonna be talking about the language, the universal language of shape and pattern. So I want you to get excited about, there's one particular shape here that I've brought along. Um, it's a glass model, but to, to the average person, it just looks like the squares and triangles. And, and my friend who makes these in Byron Bay, he says this is the most unpopular shape in the whole shop that he makes. Um, he's an Israeli friend. So the symbol of Israel, as you know, is the Star of David. So the shapes that sell, for example, would be the three-dimensional Star of David. So you can see this exotic shape. And basically all it is is a cube. We're just looking at a cube here. If you joined all these points from here to there, you've got a cubic structure. But um, it's interesting that, so the whole world now is wearing this jewelry called the Star Tetrahedral Merkaba jewelry. But my prediction is that in 10 years time, everyone's gonna get excited about this shape. I'm just gonna give it a name. It's got a strange Greek name called cube octahedron. It's a combination of the cube and an octahedron. And there's something very special about this shape, which is what I'm going to talk a lot about in July. So just remember the name is called cube octahedron. I'm going to show you lots of versions of it. Um, so, so here's another form of it here. There's actually another form. If I took that same glass shape called cube octahedron, but I, I do it with some um, 24 sticks because 24 is a stargate number. 24 is something very special if you want to, um, get into the higher dimensional mathematics. But this cube octahedron is something that under compression, it can squeeze and shape, I just shape shifted. It just suddenly became an octahedron. So this shape cube octa could bend its own physics and create a structure. This is a crystal of, oct this is an octahedral crystal of fluorite, which I think a lot of you are familiar with. So this is one of the basic building blocks of atomic structure. So all I did was a, a compression. I went, I went a half compression makes 20 triangles. That's called icosa. A full compression makes a diamond. But if I squeeze it again, I end up with this pyramid. So I've got, now I've got like a square base pyramid, but one more squeeze and I end up, I'll do it again. The, so you go octahedron, squeeze, you get the pyramid. So there's a square base pyramid, one more compression. I end up with what's called a tetrahedron. So this is the basic building block of everything we know. All structure is composed of tetrahedra. Um, yeah, so this is all from a shape that has 12 vertices. The cube octahedron has 12 vertices, um, which is the 12 spheres around the one. So if you could, if you could visualize that inside the sphere, there was a globe, there could be 12 possible spheres that pack around it. So these are the 12 centers of the 12 spheres that were part of our creation. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, begin a sort of a journey where originally we were one sphere. Let's just say I had a sphere. Here's a sphere here. So that, let's say in the beginning of creation, we were one sphere. And then the one became the two and the two became the four. We call this mitosis. So when we were four cells, the, the, if, we, if we could examine the four cells, the center of the four cells, you'd have a structure called tetrahedron. So this is uh, the most simplest volume of creation called tetrahedron. Um, and if you can see the string in here, you can actually see that there's actually a square in the tetrahedron there, which is very unusual. It's one of the puzzles that we're going to examine in July in Sharks. Um, last year when I gave this lecture, we were looking at the journey from the three to the four, to the five, to the six. So this is showing that embedded in the threeness, the tetra is the, is the square for four. And then, so when, so the unusual thing is that our very beginnings of life was um, a geometrical construct. We were actually a pyramid. Um, here's another smaller version of it as a crystal. So this is a um, hematite 
So this hematite crystal shows you the basic building block. And then when the, the four cells divide again, we become a cube, we, we become eight cells. So you can see from eight cells, we become cubic. So we all understand the cube. But really, if you were to, if you were like a magic spider and you could go inside the cube, you could find more geometry inside the cube. So this is where this shape came from. So, so this star tetrahedron is actually what's inside the cube. So this is your um, memory. Memory is stored at the base of your spine. These, this is your eight original cells. And then the eight cells became um, 16 cells. And 16 cells has got to do with something called Metatron's cube which I'll show you in a bit of a slideshow. I've got 10 minutes to show you geometry and I'll show you some more patterns. After 16 cells, we became a binary code. We went from 16, 32, 64. If we keep doubling these numbers, 64, 128. So double that is 256 and double that again is 512. So when we became 512 cells, we became a blob. We just became, we went from stark male geometry to something very feminine. So this this is what you looked like in the first hour of your creation. So to give this a name, I'd call it cosmogenesis, the beginnings or the memory of where we came from. This is what the definition of sacred geometry is. So the whole world has been studying physics about Big Bang, where they think everything is about explosion. So the current world paradigm is saying there's only explosion, which is what we use with rocket fuel and cars and it creates pollution. But the opposite of explosion, which is about going out and blowing things up, is something about that's going towards the center. So here we have the concept of implosion, which is more harmonious with nature. So, so this is called torus and torus is, uh, means ring. The, the thing that we put on our finger is a ring. So we, our cellular memory is the torus which is a hyperdimensional or four-dimensional sphere that's collapsed towards its center. So Dan Winter would say that this is about getting sucked in. So you can see and the, the motions of going in and then out. So then you turn it around and you're going out. So I believe that there's only two directions. There's an in and the out. So when you were forming embryonically, this, um, this section here, this section here, where you're sucking in is your mouth. So this became your mouth and the other side became your anus. There was no north, south, east or west. I don't believe in the six directions. I believe we're just in and out like that. So that's our first primal memory. Um, but before all of that started, before the one separated, before the one became the two, became the four, eight, 16, which is a doubling sequence, there was one shape that was connected to all things. Um, back to this cube octahedron. So this was the shape before the one became the two. This was the shape that surrounded all living things around all animal cells and plant cells. I'm gonna show you a bit of a slideshow with Daryl Langham, who studied um, plant genetics. And he, he was saying that the 12, um, for creation to happen, we had to have a grid of 12 sperms to penetrate the central ovum. So the geometry of creation was the 12 around the one. And I'm going to show you this again as a copper structure. So if you can see this shape here, that's the 12 vertices, that's the 12 centers of the 12 spheres, the vertex, and they all have the radials here. There's 12 vectors or internal radials here. And this is the most balanced shape in the universe. I could say it's all from hexagons, I'm holding six, six sides there, that's a hexagon. And if I turn it around, there's another six here and another six here. So, so the code for this, a numerical signature for cube octa is six, 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 four sixes. And to me, it's the most balanced shape of the universe, but this was the geometry that gave creation. And it's around not just humans and animals, but it's around plants. Um, I'm gonna be showing this in depth in charts. So here's another ring. Uh, you know, when we look at um, NASA and physics and atomic structure, we, we often represented it with rings, like the symbol for NASA and atomic structure 
is ring. So if I pull these four rings apart, if you can get it very correctly, you'll just get a grid of squares and circles. So I won't go into detail, but if you could visualize that this is actually squares and triangles, then we have um, the cube octa again. And another derivation of cube octa is I could take a cube and if I sliced these eight corners of the eight cubes like that, I would end up with another shape that when this turns itself inside out, I've, that's the cube octahedron. So I started from a cube, I'll go back to the cube. So this is the cube. So we started off with the cube, which is about stability, formation, structure, but it, these shapes have the ability to shape shift alchemically and become another thing. So this is the cube octahedron, the 12 around the one. I'll be bringing these to charts so you can sort of picture it a bit better. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to, um, I'll just see, I'm gonna click on share screen so I can show you a bit of a PowerPoint. Okay, great. So I just, the, when I come to Schatz, um, I'm gonna talk on the first day about this cube octahedron. So you can see a giant shape here. That, that shape is actually the very small shape that I was holding before. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna quickly show you some of the information I have. Um, so every day we're gonna study one of the five platonic solids, but we need to study the cube octahedron because it's not actually a platonic solid. Um, though I believe every cell in our body is one of the five platonic solids. So when we talk about platonic, we mean it's like the cube where every face is the same. But this shape here that was very much developed by um, Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller was the one that first got excited about the cube octahedron. And he, he's the one that created that vector flex or the jitterbug shape that I just showed you and compressed. But yeah, so here's, Here's the first symbolism where the 12 spheres can go around the one. So the 12 around the one is a bit like someone like an enlightened being like Jesus, when they emit enough love or share enough, they magnetize to them 12. So even though we're seeing 12, there's an expansion principle where the 12 surround the ones. So it's really a code for 13. So the 12 around the one is something very special about the number 13. And as you know, 13 got demonized. Um, so there was the one that became the two. But so before the, the original zygote, before the original zygote became two, four, eight, 16, like I just showed, we need to understand one thing is that if we have a circle, how many other circles can go around the one? So we know that six coins, as you can see, go around the one. And so, that creates a star of David. But in 3D, we know that 12 three-dimensional spheres go around the one. So there's the 12 and the 13 principle. So nature has this beautiful um, geometry where space is partitioned in the most intelligent way. And, and it came to our attention through Daryl Langham. He was a plant geneticist. That's the picture, that's the only picture I could find of him. But it's the one that made sesame seeds so that he found that if he grew sesame seeds in a circle, they grew better. He found that shape influenced the growth of sesame seeds. And I particularly love his work because I'm addicted to tahini. So it's good to know that. Um, so there's his small four rings that make cube octahedron. People are wearing it now as a jewelry. Um, because it's got to do with the connection to our origins. So by putting a quartz crystal with the 12 nodes there is a very potentizing thing. Maybe it will help us to remember what our purpose is. If we wear these geometries or build these geometries etherically around us, like Dan Winter talks about, he talks about the astral hygiene, then perhaps we can remember what our purpose is. So there's q -Bokta. So there, that was when the one became the two became the four. So this is what we look like at four cells, which is tetra. And on the next day in shards, after we talk about cube octa, we're going to do nothing but the tetrahedron. And you can see here that tetrahedron, when you join the face centers, tetra makes a copy of itself. It's the only shape in the universe that can make a copy of itself. And, and that's, a geometric infinite series because it can keep going within itself, reduced 
almost to the atomic level. So that's a very potent graphic, the small tetra within the larger tetra. It's called self-similarity. We, then we saw that the four became the eight, so you can see there's your eight cells. Um, okay, I might actually I meant to play this as a, I think this is a, um, so I was meant to be playing this as a slideshow, sorry. That's, so a lot of people at the moment are spinning their macabre field, but without getting into it, I would warn early at this point, do not spin your etheric tetrahedral grids for reasons that aren't important, but I'll discuss that in July. Um, so most people now, when we see the flower of life pattern, I see it actually as a cube. So whenever you see the hexagonal outline or shadow of something and you squint your eyes, you can actually see that it's a cube of space. So the flower of life is very cubic. And like I said, the whole world now is into star tetra cubic. And I believe in 10 years time, everyone's gonna be switching onto the next octave of awareness, which is the cube octahedron. But the cube within the cube generated from 13 circles is the nest of all the five tonic solids. So the, cube, the cubic nature is the foundation for everything. So we're not against cubic houses. As a builder by trade all my life, I was building boxes and that's why I renunciated the building game. But there's nothing essentially wrong with cubic construction. We, the cube contains all the root harmonics like root two, root three and root five, which are the precursors for discovering the phi ratio. So when we look at the cube within the cube on another level as an animation, this is what we looked like when we were 16 cells. You've got a cube of eight corners with a, inside of another larger cube with another eight. So eight and eight is 16. So this, again, shape-shifting animation is a clue to our connection to the greater mysteries, how we can literally not just shape-shift, but turn ourselves inside out and remember the connection with the galactic and the atomic. The larger and the smaller are in the same constant moving ratio, which I believe is the phi ratio that allows um, the connection. So that's what we were at 16 cells. And then we became the Taurus. So I'll just go through this quickly because you can research that. But the Taurus animations are very popular. This is one by Alex Gray showing that we are essential toroidal. The energy comes in through our crown and through our feet. So we are a living biological Taurus. Um, and the secret ultimately is to nest the tori one within the other at an intelligent ratio called the phi ratio. So later on, we're gonna talk about the shapes that contain the phi ratio. And this is the planetary energy, the North Pole and the South Pole. And we're a fractal of the Earth. So we have this same um, counter-rotating field within our being as well. Okay, so, that, so this all started before this cosmogenesis. This was the blueprint. These, these six squares and eight triangles called cube octahedron was, is the clue to our creation. And it's not a platonic solid. Platonic means it's cubic or tetrahedral, everything is the same. But because we have mixed faces, triangles and squares, it's called a semi-regular solid. And we have to give it a name because if you were to put your finger at any of those points, you'll see that it goes triangle, square, triangle, square. So the numerical signature would be three, four, three, four, something like that. Um, I'm interested in, as a builder, building these structures like a bedroom or a playground for children where the children literally get embedded in these sh shapes. Um, and it's really good to see the wire form. So there's a solid form and the wire form. So you can sort of get a sense of what's actually inside. And you can see the 12 radials and there's actually 24 triangles that all meet at the center. And you'll notice as you study geometry, the number 24, which is the reason why we have 24 hours in the day keeps popping up. So th this shape here is fractal because the inside is the same as the outside. And what that means is that if you took the edge, there's 24 sticks that make that shape. 
and each stick is the same length, but the outside length is the same as the 12 radials. I'll say that again because this is the key to fractal. This is the only shape in the universe where the inside measurements, which are the 12 radials, are identical to the outer skeleton. There is no other shape that can do that. So that's perhaps why it's the most balanced structure in the universe. That's why it existed at the first spark of creation. So there's the four rings that I showed you before, the copper tube. So there's the four rings that Kubokta used by NASA. Um, I'm, I'm showing you here, you can actually see the Star of David. If, if you took if you shined a light on the three dimensional form, we end up getting the Star of David. You can see that as a shadow there. Um, that's one of the beautiful drawings from Leonardo da Vinci. He was obsessed about this shape. Um, and there's the toy that called Vector Flex, so that was the one that I was compressing to make the five platonic solids. So it's amazing that it takes one of the 13 Archimedeans called Cube Octa, that under compression it makes the five platonic solids. So that's why this is an essential shape. And you can see the Cube Octahedron structure in the movie Contact when Jodie Foster um, goes into the other worlds and it's through a spinning geometry of the cube octahedron, which means, you know, we, we know how powerful this is. So th basically this is the tribute to cube oct um, is to Buckminster Fuller, who is the father of geodesic domes. He, he basically revered this shape. Um, okay. I might stop here and I want to show you another shape. I was just showing you there's so much information that's embedded in the cube octahedron. Like th th this has an infinite storehouse of data just in those 12 radials. This to me, there's no one I know, there's no one really talking about this shape. I don't know why. But what I wanted to show you, what there's another shape that's associated to this shape. It's called the jewel. A jewel. Um, is the shape that if, if you could visualize a spider, a magic spider goes to the center of all the faces. So we've got squares and triangles. If, if a magic spider could connect the, tw the 14 dots because the six squares and the eight triangles constitutes 14 shapes. So if you put the dot in the center of every triangle, every square, magic spider goes in and draws another shape. And this is what it gets. So the shape that's eternally married, it's called conjugal. Conjugal means marriage because this shape here is what's inside the cube octahedron. It's called the 12 diamonds. So remember the cube octa had 12 internal radial vectors. So if you can see those 12 vectors, I'll actually hold one. So I'm actually holding, I'm actually holding one of the 12 radials. So we know that, um, See, and if you, if you tilt it there, can you see the hex, hexagonal? So when you see a hexagon, you know you're really looking at a cube. But anyway, when you join the, the 14 face centers, the marriage, the conjugal pair or the jewel is got 12 diamonds. So in ancient Greek, the word for 12 was dodeca and the word for face was called hedron. So the 12 face diamond is called rhombic, means diamond, rhombic. So this is a rhombic dodecahedron. And this shape exists in the natural world as a crystal. I'm going to put it really close to the screen. So this is a garnet crystal, and I'm, I'm just going to move it around, hoping that you might see some of the diamond faces. Um, this one's been polished, so I should have some other one. There's the diamond face. Can you see the diamond face? So this is the garnet crystal, which is the raw form of this sh shape. So the, the converse is true. That means if I have this shape called rhombic dodecahedron, if I have this shape and I put a dot, okay, there, there's a diamond here. There's a diamond here. I put a dot there and a dot there and a dot there. If I put a dot in the 12 centers of the 12 diamonds and I went inside the shape and connected internally the 12 face centers, I end up getting cube octahedron. So so when, what we're going to do on, at Shards is we're going to look at all the other pairs or shapes in the universe that are eternally married. So we know that when we look at um, 
when we look at a cube, the shape that's inside the cube when you join the centers is an octahedron. So this, this is what's inside the cube. So cube and octa are eternally married. And when you fuse the cube and the octa, that's how we derived the cube octahedron anyway. But, there's a, but all this mathematics here on the cube octahedron is based on root two. Root two is the diagonal of a square. So root two means if I take this square here and I call it one and one, the diagonal that, that goes from opposing corners is called root two, which is 1.414. If I took the diagonal from this point to the opposing diagonal space, so I'm holding what we call opposing space diagonals, the, the, the distance is called root three. So root three is what goes through the internal diagonal. But the other important harmonic is, is root two, root three, and root five. To get root five, which is what creates the golden ratio, is we need a double cube. So when we put the cube within the cube, or if you could visualize one cube with another one on top, the diagonal, the long diagonal, gives us root five. So that's why the cube is critical because it's, um, it, it creates all the root harmonics. And the reason why I'm showing you the garnet crystal is because it is based on root two. And yet researchers like myself were fascinated by the phi ratio. So I've been looking for, for 30 years to can a shape that um, I've been looking for the, the golden ratio within this shape. Because this is cubic, we say it doesn't contain the phi ratio, but I'm going to show you a secret that was revealed. It was either by Dan Winter or Nassim Haramine, but what they did was they showed that that this shape here doesn't contain um, the phi ratio, but it, it's held here. So when I so when I take the cube octahedron again here, so this is the cube octa, the vector flexor, and and as as you compress it. It's meant to go like a washing machine, left, right, left, right. But because the joints aren't perfect, it's not doing the right spin. So, so, so what, what, what Dan Winter did was he put a bead. So here's one of the sticks. If you were to put a bead here on this edge, there's 24 edges. If we could get a camera and put a bead at that point, and, and if you kept your eye just on that point, as we squeeze towards the center under compression, the path of that bead forms um, the path of the bead forms the ram's horn, which, as you know, is a three-dimensional nautilus shell. This this is the 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 phi ratio. If we converted the Fibonacci numbers, which we looked at last year, into cubes, and we went from one, two, three, five, eight, like bigger and bigger cubes, the path of the um, the curvature within those cubes actually forms a ram's horn. And as we know, the problem with the ram's horn is that it got demonized. They took, they, they took the ram's horn, which was the emblem of Pan. They took the, um, the symbols of Pan, which is the God of nature, and people demonized it so that they create fear associated to the living mathematics of nature. So basically you don't study it. And so that's why we're doing this is so that we can release the, fear associated to sacred geometry. Um, there is one other shape. Um, I, want, I don't have the big model here, but this has 12 diamonds. This is the garnet crystal, which is what lives inside the 12 around the one. But there's another shape like this that's not based on root two. It's based on the golden ratio. And I don't have the big model here, but I have it as a jury. I don't know if you can see this this is another diamond form and there's 30 of them so this jewelry that i'm particularly wearing is all based on the phi ratio so we've gone from root two to root five so just wanted to let you know that the more we study sacred geometry there's this hyper dimensional knowledge encoded in the most simplest shapes from the triangle to the square to the pentagon the more you research this, they're like doors. They will just literally open up and reveal to you the secrets that are waiting to be discovered. So um, when we see, when I see you in July, we're gonna spend five days just 
on these five platonic solids. Um, so every day, so the first day we'll do q octa, the 12 around the one. The second day we're gonna study the two pairs called cube and octa from the platonic solids. Uh, the third day we're gonna do tetrahedron because that's a whole fractal on its own. And the next day we're going to do the union of Icosa de Deca. See, we've got 20 triangles here in the Icosa and 12 pentagons here. So these two make each other. So these two, oh, they look like my eyes there. Th these two are um, based on the golden ratio and they're married, they make each other as well. So that's called the Icosa Dideca. And that's something also to get very excited about because the other two that I just mentioned, the cube and the octa, they're based on root two. They're not based on the golden ratio. And then on the fifth day, I want to look at what we call the nesting. What happens is instead of looking at the five shapes as separate units, there's a particular shape like the Russian dolls where the five shapes exist one within the other. That's based on Kepler's model of the planetary system. So that's actually the real secret. It's, it's got a lot to do with the five, the, Chinese five elements when they're all embedded as one is perhaps the greatest grand secret what all this is about not studying the separate shapes but seeing the cohesion that how they all grow one into the other okay so um I'll turn you over back to Karen and if there's any questions I can talk about that thank you very much thank you very much Jean that was fantastic and uh, we're all really looking forward to what's going to happen when we're together in charge. And um, we'd like to open the conversation for any questions or comments from others. Well, well Jane, I have a question yeah. to, to, to launch things. Um, the, um, the form, the cube, cube, cube octagon. A cube octahedron. The cube octahedron, thank you. Yep. And, and, and and you 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 said when you were collapsing it, it you could form it into any of the platonic solids and I didn't see how it, it brought forward the dodecahedron. Okay, can I can I show you slowly? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, because I I had limited time, I couldn't show the full progression. But this is the work of Buckminster Fuller. So he puts he has a giant version of this. So there's a I'm holding a triangle base. So if you put this on the table and under compression, naturally it's gonna go, I'll, I'll do it this way. Um, if I'm holding the triangular base, it's gonna go straight to an octahedron, but the step in between that, if I only went halfway, um, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna get you to look at this red stick here, which this, the distance from the red stick to these two vertices here are in root two, they're different, like if that's, um, if this is one, this is 1.4. But if I did a half compression, if, if, if I just only just do a little squeeze, I suddenly have what we call is icosa. If you can, this is one of the five platonic solids. All I did was a little squeeze. I'll do it again. I do a little squeeze and suddenly every length is the same. So, so what's inside of that is the dodecahedron because icosa, which has 20 triangles, is married or conjugal to dodecahedron, they're a pair. So even though you can't see dodecahedron, it's inside of the 20 triangles. So, so when I say dodecahedron, we're looking at something with 12 pentagons, there's 12 pentagons there. So that's what's actually inside, yeah. Um, does that help you explain, does that explain it? Um, I, I understand what, what, what you did, yes. Yeah. But when I'm demonstrating live, we can actually measure and stop and see that everything is exact. Yeah. And okay. in fact, what we can do is build a giant version of that with broomsticks. What I'd like to do is on, when we're at Shards, I'm gonna try and bring along some broomsticks so that we can build these shapes in the room and actually show what happens. Yeah. Good, okay. Well, let's, let's open the floor to other people. Karen, we have a question that says, how is Metatron's cube related to the platonic solids? That from Renee. 
See, Metatron's cube is based on the 13 circles. We have one circle with the six around the one. So we have one in the middle, then six, and, and that's the, um, what they're calling carbon seven. When they're doing nanotechnology today, nanotechnology is based on something called carbon seven. So you've got one carbon and there's like six around it. And then they put another six. If you put another six around the six, you have 13. And that grid of 13 circles makes all the five platonic solids. Um, so Metatron's cube metaphorically in space is Metatron's like the god of electron, the god of creation. So when we have a cube within the bigger cube, we've got eight corners of a small cube with another eight in the larger. That's a, that's a um, even though 13 circles created the grid, we, we, we're looking at something that had 16 cell division because Metatron's cube, as I was saying, is part of our cellular division, mitotic division. And, and that's the shape that can go infinitely large and infinitely small. That's why it can be used in nanotechnology um, because it can, what's important is the scale. The, when the scale is based on a fractal where the inside is the same as the outside and the scaling rate is based on what they call 1.618, which is the mathematics of the arm. So Buckminster Fuller said that nature abhors equilibrium. Nature doesn't do things in perfect balance. So the elbow doesn't bend exactly in the middle. Your elbow doesn't bend exactly in the middle. It bends at a ratio called 0.618. So if this is eight units and that's 13, the shorter to the longer is called 0.618. So when we have a structure, a fractal, where one shape like a cube is within the bigger cube, and because the harmonics of the double cube connect with the phi ratio, it allows what they call scale invariance. Scale invariance means its size doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's something infinitely large or infinitely small. We can access the memory of the universe and the atom because the ratio is sacred. The ratio is correct. So that's what they're saying. That's what scale invariance means. We're not worried about the size. We're only worried about the ratio, which is what Pythagoras was talking about. And I believe... It's Metatron's cube that's, that is the engineering for it. It's, well, first of all, we've got the um, tetrahedron. So, so inside, the, we're going to do one whole day just on the tetrahedron. And you can see, so inside the tetrahedron is another smaller tetrahedron. You can't see it here, but if you were to join all the centers of the triangles, there'd be an inverted tetrahedron. So the reason why we're studying tetrahedron on its own is that it's not just the first volume of creation. It's not just what we looked like in the first minutes of creation, but tetrahedron is its own self dual. It means it makes a copy of itself. No other shape can do that because the cube makes a different shape called octahedron. So, so if, if we have an octahedron and we join the eight centers of the eight triangles inside of this, is a cube. So one shape makes another shape, but the beauty of the tetrahedron is symbolically, it makes a copy of itself. That, and that alone is a huge statement. We call it self-similar. So self-similar means with Metatron's cube is that when we have a small cube nested in the larger cube and the scale is at the right intelligent ratio based on nature, then we can travel the universe. That's my understanding of that. I'm not sure everyone was able to follow all of that, but it was quite interesting. You, you don't happen to have a little model of the Metatron cube, do you? No, I, I that... do, but not with me on the desk. I've only just got a, a few on the desk here. Oh. So that, um... well, we'll see it when we come to start. Yes, definitely, definitely. Okay. Jane, there's a, a couple of chat questions. One from Sheila, can you find the spiral in the ram's horn or is it something more complex like a torus? Well, in the ram's horn, I mean, I do see that as the ultimate spiral, but what, what you, the, the creation of this comes from the Fibonacci numbers when we turn them not into squares, but into cubes. So if this, if this curvature here is inside of a cube that is eight by eight, then the next section here is another cube where that curve here 
is on is based on a five by five cube and then three by three two by two so the the curvature of the ram's horn is a journey from the long wave that goes infinitely large like to the macrocosm and as it compresses and collapses it goes into the atom so 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 this was based on a cubic model um i don't know if i really answered that but i'm always looking at what's the mathematical derivation like the pure principle of where did this shape come from and it's from a nest of cubes but we could only get this shape if we made the cubes obey the mathematics of flowers, like it has to be in the ratio three is to five is to eight. So th this is probably the most potent spiral that I know of. So, and I, I think the question was the relationship to the torus is that if I put one, if, I, if I'm spinning, imagine this five spiral, this is a five spiral spinning clockwise. And if someone else was able to connect the points and turn the up, the one the other way. So imagine two rams horn, one spinning one way and the other spinning the other way. The resolution of these two cones would be the torus. That would be because the torus embraces the counter rotating fields. Dan Winter would call it the um, two pine cones are kissing. Um, that's his analogy for sacred geometry is that, and the secret to whole free energy systems. If you can visualize two pine two pine cones that are kissing or touching that connects the, the atom to the galaxy without what he calls non-destructively. Because if we don't use the pine cone mathematics of flowers, the, the destruction of the wavelength would happen and we don't go anywhere. So you can turn your motor on but not travel. But to travel, you need to copy nature. We need to study the, the fundamental Fibonacci series that developed this beautiful spiral and i think that's the same spiral that's in our ear the, the cochlea is also a spiral based on this that picks up the vibration so that we can turn vibration into sound i hope that answered your question i'm not sure if i just detoured but i think you that's did and there's one more question that's on the chat that's um, from Renee asking if you talk about the elements in relation to, you know, fire, air, water, and earth in relationship to the five platonic solids. I think Mike, that Michael, because Michael Rice will be taught, we're going to be sharing the lecture room. So I think Michael being a bioarchitect and his, that's his forte, I'm sure he'll be able to talk about the elements so we know that the tetrahedron makes is fire and that the cube is the earth. And so they all relate to the five Chinese elements. But the, the real exciting thing is when you put the five elements together, I don't have the model here, but there's the nesting of the five platonic solids, which is the fifth day. And that's the real secret because we're not just studying fire, earth, air, and water separately. What happens is when we put the five geometric configurations into one, matrix that's when the magic happens and that's um, when i teach this in asia they get really excited because they didn't know about say the five platonic solids but they know all about the five elements well here's the five elements as five geometries and they're all dovetailed the the tetra creates the cube the cube creates the dodeca and, and it's a natural um bifurcation or growing of things we're not fudging anything the shapes fit in 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 each other beautifully so there is another divine relationship between the elements maybe it's another teacher's work to show that my 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 level of expertise is to say how do we take this esoteric knowledge that the ancients knew of so my job is to translate that down to the level of say a 10 year old so last year when we we're at shards as you know all we did was worksheets we we took stuff on the prime numbers or the digital compression of the times table. And what we did is we made exotic mandala patterns from that. So by turning numbers into pictures, we're going from the left brain to the right brain, because numbers is left brain and pictures is right. So that creates what I call whole brain learning. So my job is to, that's why I want to explain the five platonic solids so that Michael Rice can then do his mastery having 
once you've got the fundamentals of the, the five elements, then Mike was going to come along and just blow you out with the higher level and application of that. But you need to know what each shape means. And there's, there's a lot embedded in each shape, as you know. Thank you. So, Renee, I would just like to add that on the first day, on Monday morning, I'm going to be speaking about the five platonic solids in relation to the elements, exactly what you asked in, in a very um, unique way, as a way of introducing sacred geometry. Fantastic. So, well, as we uh, bring this thing to a close, Karen, I just want to uh, thank everyone again, but also urge everyone that hasn't registered yet for Chartres to do so. Uh, you can do it on our website uh, by just going to our, you know, course calendar uh, to uh, the Chartres uh, link uh, to the syllabus or any of the uh, emails that you've received uh, from us. Uh, there's a place uh, on all of them where you can just register. As you can see from what Jane has done just in a few minutes, uh, it leaves your head kind of spinning with the profound simplicity but complexity of, of number. And uh, so uh, uh, we want to invite everybody to register for uh, the course coming up uh, this week, uh, the first week of July. Thank you, Jim. So I'd like to invite Apila to give a closing prayer for us until we meet again. Our next call is on March 22nd, Thursday, March 22nd, and we'll receive an invitation to that. And hope to you'll all join us again. And Apila, would you be kind enough to close our gathering today with a prayer? Holy Mother, your veil slips from our faces. In its movement, all the forms, all the life, implicit in us, through us, of us, we awake. Oh, Mama. Oh, I know. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you again, Jane. And thank you, Jane. Shay. Hi, Father Shay. Um, I know Michael was is on with us somewhere, and um, um, Kaylin is on. I saw him for a moment. Just want to thank everyone and thank all of you for joining us and very much look forward to seeing you all next month and in July. March. <laughs> Aloha. Bye, Aloha. Night. 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 Night, Jim. Good night, Apila. <laughs>